Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Katherine Behar. I'm an associate professor in the Fine and Performing Arts Department at Baruch College, and I run the New Media Art Space Gallery and New Media Arts Program at Art Baruch. Space Gallery and New Media Thank Arts you Program so at much Space for um, joining us for this semester's New Media Art Space Visiting Artist Lecture. I am very pleased to welcome our spring 2021 visiting artist, Projecta Patnis, who's joining us this evening from Mumbai, where I must add, it is extremely early tomorrow morning. So we are so grateful that she can be here virtually. We're grateful for all of the time she's been able to spend with our students in the program this semester. And we are even more grateful for her generosity in accommodating the time tonight. So this semester, we have been privileged to present Projecta's work in a completely digital solo exhibition, Projecta Putness, The Slow Burn, which is on view through May 7th online at newmediaartspace.info. Tonight, Projecta will be speaking with us about her exceptional career, sharing works that extend over two decades of her practice and span quite diverse media from analog to digital. So on a personal note, before I introduce our guest, I want to share a little bit of background about how this exhibition came about. So I met Projecta in Mumbai in 2017, and she very graciously hosted me for a memorable studio visit. And during our first conversation, I immediately felt that somehow our perspectives clicked and some of her images, in particular her freezer works from that visit, stuck with me. So much so, in fact, that when in March of 2020, New York went into lockdown, Projecta's freezers came back into my mind. Suddenly, all of our NMA students were needing to make art using anything available in their living spaces. And I kept thinking about how her freezers reinvent a common domestic appliance and create new landscapes where before there was only a confined sterile box. Very much like the box like lockdown apartments where so many of us found ourselves sheltering in at that time. So when I got ready to contact Projecta about the possibility of this exhibition, I found out and could hardly believe that she had just launched a new exhibition with themes even more relevant and eerily prescient of the pandemic. So we decided to combine these two bodies of work as a starting place for this exhibition and translate them into a digital interactive online format. In my view, an artist like Projecta Potness is uniquely situated to help us comprehend the new textures of our experiences in these unprecedented times. Her artwork doesn't seek so much to explain our experiences, but rather it enables us to have other kinds of emotional access to our experiences as we try to understand them in many different registers. And Projecta's work does this uncannily well, and I think we'll all get a taste of that tonight. So a couple of housekeeping notes um, before we begin. First, for our live stream audience, it's so great to see so many of you on YouTube. Please go ahead and enter your questions in the comments box on YouTube. Um, the New Media Art Space team is here. They are moderating the feed. And so Projecta will be speaking for about an hour, and then we'll end with 15 minutes for Q&A. And at that time, we will answer as many of your questions as we can. Additionally, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors and supporters for this event. This event is sponsored by the Sandra K. Wasserman Jewish Studies Center and supported by the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences, the Newman Library, the Fine and Performing Arts Department, all at Baruch, as well as Project 88 in Mumbai, which represents Projecta's work. As well, I'd like to acknowledge some of the many individuals who made the exhibition and event possible. So I'd like to begin with the incredible student staff of the New Media Art Space. Um, you're seeing some of them on screen right now. Jose Benitez, Caitlin Chu, Millie Encarnacion, Maya Hilbert, Keisha Valista, and Brian Campana. So I want to invite them all to uh, step out from behind the scenes uh, for a moment to receive some recognition and thanks for all of the tremendous work that they've put into this exhibition. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge Interim Dean Jessica Lang, Professor Andrew Sloan, who are co-directors of the Wasserman Jewish Studies Center, Dean Arthur Downing, Chairperson Anschwers, Buchoy, Amanda Becker, um, Karina Pescesi, and BCTC. And now, finally, I would like to introduce Projecta Putness. 
project a partners' practice sales through painting, site-specific sculptural installations and public art interventions. She has extensively shown her works since 2001, nationally in India and internationally throughout Europe, Asia, and North America. Her solo projects include A Body Without Organs at Project 88 Mumbai in 2020, When the Wind Blows at Project 88 in 2016, Kitchen Debate at the Kunstlerhaus Batanian in Berlin in 2014, Time Lapse at the Guild Art Gallery in Mumbai, and Local Time at Experimenter in Kolkata, both in uh, 2012, Porous Walls at Guild Art Gallery Mumbai and Membranes and Margins at M Gallery South Korea, both in 2008, and Walls in Between at the Guild Art Gallery in 2006. She also did an extensive project commissioned by the Sharjah Art Foundation as part of a Tripoli agreement curated by Renan Lauren in collaboration with Air Arabia in 2018. And in addition, she has participated in numerous significant international exhibitions, including Now is the Time, 25 Years in the Collection, and Facing India, India from a Female Point of View, both at the Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg, in, uh, at the 2014 Kochi Biennial curated by Jitish Kalat in Kochi, India, and the Indian Highway Traveling Exhibition, the series of them at Mac Lyon uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Lyon, France, Herring Museum of Contemporary Art, Denmark, and the Astrup Fernley Museum, Norway, among many other exhibitions. Patnis's work appears in numerous books, and she has been awarded multiple international residencies. She won the Umrau Singh Shergal Grant for Photography in 2016 and 17, and her work is held in the collection of the Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg. So with all of that, please join me in welcoming Projecta Patnis. Uh, Projecta, I will turn it over to you now, and thank you so much for being here. We're so looking forward to the work you'll share with us tonight. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Burr College, and uh, obviously the Dosian team. I think they've been amazing. The show would not have been possible uh, without all of you. So uh, thank you, team. It's, it's really been amazing. And Catherine, especially to you, I think these, these conversations over the last few months have been incredible. Um, I think also, I mean, not just speaking about work, but also to just go through this whole difficult situation that we all are in. Um, it was nice to share notes and um, yeah, also an artist's point of view. Uh, so it was great sharing uh, thoughts and ideas. Um, Thank you for the show. I don't think this would have been possible without, uh, you know, collaborating with you because I think uh, the show that's there, um, the online exhibition that we've all put together is, um, is not just my effort. It's these are works which were done few, you know, few years ago and we have just kind of curated them in, in such a way that they pan out and, and narrate um, something about today's moment um, so thank you for that and uh, i thought that i would take everyone on a journey uh, behind the works uh, behind these images that you see um, in the online exhibition and i thought it'll be nice to also see the landscape of art uh, from where i have created it um, of, of India, of, of the art scene in India, because I think art emerges from the schooling that one has, um, from the landscape that one is living and surrounded with. Um, so these are glimpses of some works which I thought are kind of crucial within my practice, and I thought I'd kind of share them with everyone um, and uh, see how this goes, uh, yeah. So uh, Brian, should we start sharing the screen? Um, I think the first one, um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, super. Um, so just to uh, give a glimpse of 
where I kind of come. Um, I, uh, I grew up in a middle class uh, Indian household. Um, and uh, so we didn't have any, uh, you know, any, any relatives, any people around me who wanted to uh, become artists. So it, uh, it, it almost uh, the idea of being an artist, the idea of choosing art as a career um, came thankfully to me through an art professor I had in school and quite inspired me. Um, and I think it, it was also a need that came from an experience where, you know, you, we in our middle class homes were told to either become doctors or engineers. Those were the careers that, um, that an individual had to choose. And, uh, it was, um, it was quite uh, strangely taken when I said, no, I want to be an artist and I wanted to kind of go to this one art college, which is kind of an important art college in uh, the only art college actually in uh, at that time in the 90s in, in Bombay, which is called the JJ School of Art. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I had met this drawing teacher of mine in school who inspired me to kind of take and pursue what I believed in. And uh, yeah. Uh, but JJ School of Art is, uh, was an interesting art college. It's a college which is uh, actually uh, has a lot of colonial uh, kind of study. So uh, we were taught figurative drawing, European art history, and uh, things like that, which are completely uh, based in European art. Um, there were some fantastic artists and some fantastic seniors who kind of inspired and were doing some amazing work. Um, also situated in Bombay, I think, uh, made a huge difference to the, the way one was kind of developing one's language in Chile. Um, also because one was looking at, you know, we were exposed, thankfully, to some amazing world cinema, which was being showcased in Bombay at that time. Uh, we had uh, access to some um, interesting people, minds who were coming, traveling, passing by Bombay, uh, discussing art, discussing literature, discussing movies. And I think all that somehow uh, trickles into your uh, subconscious, uh, because what's happening in college is, is extremely, um, you know, uh, conservative or I don't think we even had a subject like installation art or things like that. We, we had figurative drawings. We had, uh, um, you know, uh, we had, we had very limited access, uh, to kind of world art that was happening. Also, internet was not really accessible at that time. So whatever one understood was through actually questioning one's own uh, surrounding ideas and art that came to you through books. Um, Brian, can we move to the next uh, slide? Uh, the title is Holes. Yeah. And uh, so I was fascinated by uh, site-specific installations, which I saw in one of the books on uh, installation art. Uh, and uh, I was fascinated by the idea that one could make work uh, without the pressure of, uh, you know, being shown in a white cube space. One could just make art anywhere. Um, and uh, so this was a work I did in my parents' bedroom. This was 1999, and I basically used, uh, you know, the bindis. These are uh, bindis used by Indian women uh, on their foreheads. These are uh, dots, um, but they have some significance. They have a, a kind of a religious significance, a cultural significance. Um, what I did was I kind of stuck them onto, um, onto the wall um, next to a plug. And the whole idea was to kind of, um, you know, imagine these 
holes which were kind of probably you know like an like an illusional hole um onto the wall um the idea was also to kind of question and to probably also um in a way expose uh you know people around me to say that this is also art um because what happens as soon as you enter an art college is that you're expected to kind of draw beautifully you know you you're expected to probably be good at mehndi which is a traditional or, or you know a henna uh, design which is a very traditional form of art and uh or, or you know so 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 the expectation is uh of the people around you uh is totally based on a certain stereotyping of art and i kind of wanted to question that and say this is also art and this can also be you know considered art so this was my defiance at that time i think and uh, but i think it i mean i i'm showing this work today and looking back at it also to see how it has roots to a lot of other works that i did in future i think we can move to the next slide prime and uh, this is titled behind my bat this was done in my college uh, this was a college work and um i was so i studied painting i uh, we had to kind of uh, you know adhere to certain kind of forms of art and uh, so we so i chose uh, painting at that time and um, try to push my own boundaries around painting and so what you see here is actually a painting and a photograph of a close up of a skin uh but through this work i was also trying to look at narration in art and in, in painting and uh, what it means to probably um narrate a story do i have to have a story to narrate and how does one kind of narrate that and these are really formative works these are works which were you know really you know you're trying to kind of create your own language you're trying to define a new language for yourself so um for for me this work is between painting and 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 what it is to you know between a painting and a photographic image so so it, it the idea was just that you know there's this person who's probably sat on this couch and and has got this print uh on his back literally and it was about people talking behind people's backs and it was also about um uh you know idea i uh, idea based uh in a way but i think for me it's crucial in terms of the language of painting and photograph of a document which is a photograph being an actual document of evidence whereas a painting which comes probably from memory and and um and has some base in probably memory and time and fantasy yeah i think we can move to the next image brian so moving back to the site specific works and this was one site specific work i uh, i uh, showed at this residency that i was in in 2005 and uh, i've been fascinated by walls and walls especially from middle class homes um you know i think it's almost like we live in cardboard boxes i can almost hear what my neighbor is saying and you know um and to look at the wall as a as a fragile uh, curtain as a porous wall between the inside and the outside um so here what i did was i actually just used cloth uh, uh, which i stitched up and i kind of made it into a frill and uh, uh, placed it at the bottom of the skirting of the wall and uh, the whole idea was to kind of look at this you know this really hard uh you know strong uh wall uh, as as a porous fragile setting um uh, this was shown at the coj presidency uh brian we can move to the next one it was later shown at the zakanta national gallery of art in 
or so in 2011. And here, obviously, the, you know, the work looks quite different from the earlier uh, iteration. Um, you know, you have these really ornate walls. And then, so, so for me, here it almost turns into a wedding uh, dress. The whole architectural space becomes extremely feminine and almost, um, you know, yeah. Can we move to the next image? Right. Here's a detail of it. So the whole idea was that it looks like the cloth is almost an extension of the wall and doesn't feel like a separate um, medium or a material. Can we move to the next image, Brian? So I think I, I'm, I mean, within the work and, and I think, uh, the work has always been around everyday objects and everyday experiences. Um, this was 2008 and uh, the title of the work is Porous Walls. So I basically used everyday objects like, uh, you know, these. there's a bulb here that you see. Um, and I stuck these beads onto these everyday objects. Uh, so initially, I, I had no idea of what I was doing. I was just, I, I really had this urge to just uh, adorn most of these everyday objects with some kind of, you know, this extension of this growth, um, as though as though they had some kind of a cancerous growth on, you know, on them. Can we see the next image, Brian? Yeah, so things like this. The, I had taken almost everything that was lying around in the studio. Um, and it, the initial part of the, uh, or the initial uh, uh, idea of the work came from an absolute impulse of just like really sticking these beads onto everyday objects. And I really had no clue what I was uh, trying to do. Uh, but it was also a time um, when I was looking at the idea of uh, a cancerous growth uh, within one's own body. It was also a time when um, uh, I had seen my mom's uh, uterus, which which had uh, been terminated, and um, it it you know it had it was full of fibroids, and that's why it had to be operated and. I'd seen that visually and this whole idea of some kind of a cancerous growth within one's own body and, you know, not realizing that there is some kind of um, thing that is probably destroying one from the inside uh, was playing on my mind. And I think this whole body of work came from, from that kind of an impetus. Can we move to the next image? This is how it was shown. This was part of my solo exhibition. Um, it was called uh, Porous Walls. It was shown at the Guild Art Gallery. And I basically made these really, these many objects, but I had no clue how I was going to display them. Um, my initial idea was to just have them in my studio and call people and ask them to come and visit the studio where and, and have them displayed within the site. Um, but then I was also wanting to see what would they look like if they go into a white cube space? How do they react there? Can they, are they misfits in a space like that? Do they make sense in a space like that? Um, so what I did was I kind of installed them. Can we move to the next image? I installed them onto these granite uh, platforms and uh, carved some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of drawings and I, I carved some kind of forms onto these granite platforms. Uh, why granite platforms? I was thinking of uh, kitchen platforms, actually. So I wanted to place these everyday objects onto kitchen platforms. And uh, and, and have them almost like some kind of specimens that were lying on, on these platforms.
can we see the next image yeah so here there is like a reference of a, a washing uh, of a wash basin basically that you see that's carved so so it's almost like uh the it's not really a pedestal it becomes an installational uh sculptural object on which these sculptures have been placed uh and uh, it was to have various references to uh you know some kind of uh like like these everyday objects had been excavated from you know some place and they were left onto these platforms um but today when i look at it it also has the notations to some kind of a virus which has been you know affected the whole system can we go back to this um slide which is uh, i think the installation one uh, slide number 9 brian and uh, yeah so it, it today when i look at it it, it always feels like uh, you know it, it, it there's a home which has been completely disrupted uh, by some kind of a uh, some something has hacked into its system and and totally affected it thanks brian can we go to slide number 12 so i made these cultural objects and i kind of you know uh made them with these beads and things like that and then the issue was to store them and this is a practical issue that most artists face because um be working from a really tiny spaces uh you know in bombay here we have like these really tiny um apartments that get converted into studio spaces um it was impossible to keep making sculptural objects and and you know storing these um these granite tables and i had to think of ways of making work which were which was not going to occupy so much space and i think on a because of absolute practical reasons i kind of moved towards photography i think um till then i wasn't really thinking about uh, photographing uh, photography as as a serious form for myself um but I think when I stumbled upon it it was just something that I I realized was just an extension of um the way I was thinking of uh sculptures or installations or or painting for that matter um so uh what you see here uh, is is a photographic work it's titled still life it was um uh, made in 2009 and uh, this was staged inside a refrigerator uh i think it was also a time when one was reading about how uh, you know cauliflower these uh, aubergines and tomatoes were going to be genetically modified and were going to be flooded into our markets um it was quite uh, disturbing to imagine what it would be to kind of consume these genetically modified vegetables and that's how this whole body of work came about um so what i did was i was i quite, was quite sure that i wanted to kind of make these objects these these sculptural installations and stage them inside a refrigerator or or a space where i didn't have to worry of site and and uh, didn't have to worry of storage um it was quite fascinating to kind of also see this 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 particular work actually the cauliflower one um uh through a viewfinder you know and that's something that happens with artists as well i think you cannot uh, completely imagine the work uh in a way you have some initial ideas of um, you know or intuitions of of making something but it's only through you know through being accepting of what's happening in the present moment is what 
kind of uh, reveals um, itself. Uh, so, so this was a work that I was quite sure of. I mean, I was sure that I wanted to make this um, this cultural piece through uh, a cauliflower and make it look like you know a nuclear explosion. Um, but it was only when I kind of viewed it through the viewfinder of the camera, I realized that you know this this really uh, you know because of the scale of the work and and the whole thing kind of looked more cinematic. Um, so here it is staged inside my um, you know my my refrigerator that I have in the house, and what you see uh, on the floor is actually a plastic uh, you know. Uh, sheet, um, which was actually given to me by my mother. Uh, my mom uses it uh, in her refrigerator so that, you know, you do not scratch your, uh, it's a very typical middle class thing to do that, you know, you, you're saving your uh, appliances and, and kind of taking care of them by having these really cheap looking plastic crocheted um, carpets. But that became almost like a stage to kind of set this, this dialogue. Yeah, can we move to the next image, Brian, please? Uh, this is also called Still Life. And I think that the title Still Life also comes to me uh, because I'm fascinated with still life and still life painting. Um, I, I feel like you know, when one is looking, when, when, when these objects, whatever, you know, are kept in front of you and you're trying to probably draw them onto a piece of paper, you're almost through your sense of memory and time, um, adding all those layers into the making of, of that image. Um, and there's something about stillness that I think I'm fascinated with. Um, and I think uh, probably that's one of the reservations I have when I'm working with moving images. So I, I kind of find ways of um, working through stillness to create an, a moving image. Um, for, for now, I think I'm far more comfortable with working with, say, drawing, painting, object making, sculptural objects, and site specific installations, or with photographic works, but when it comes to moving images, I really have to struggle and think of ways of working through stillness um, within, um, within the world. Can we move to the next image, Brian, please? So these are, again, the same setting. It's only uh, an upside down image. Um, uh, the, the setting is basically uh, the same, it's the refrigerator. So there's this sense of, I think, uh, growth and, and, you know, uh, some kind of an unwarranted growth um, that's uh, kind of probably growing within or, or happening within this really contained uh, space. Can we move to the next image, Brian, please? Still life. Again, cauliflowers, and I've used various mediums in it. So you see cotton, you see also these, I've used semolina to replicate it. And also, I think photography and, and, and discovering this, this medium made it almost possible for you to use uh, materials that, you know, were, uh, were going to be you know, degradable, you didn't have to worry about the life of an object, the material in that sense. So uh, it had a sen certain sense of freedom that one could, you know, have. Can we move to the next image? Then? Yeah, this is called sewing. And this was 2009 again. And I go back to the wall and I, you know, I wanted to really stitch a wall. I wanted to see what it is to kind of really stitch a wall. And I think this whole idea comes from the fact that one is, I mean, I'm looking at the idea of walls as porous. And um, so th these were threads which were stuck onto the wall to make them look like they were cracks. 
building on the wall. Um, this work was also shown at the Gwangju Biennial in 2016. Can we show the next image, Brian? It's an installation image. It was a massive wall. Next image. This is a detail of the work that was shown at the Gwangju Biennial in 2016. They're just threads which are kind of um, stuck onto the wall. Can we move to the next one, please? So the same work was also shown at uh, the Wolfsburg Museum in 2018. And this was a massive wall. This was like really massive. It was, I think, 16 meters or something. And um, yeah, I think it also, for me, becomes an idea of drawing lines. Uh, onto a wall sculpturally you're you're imagining like a line drawing onto onto a two-dimensional surface um they become cracks obviously but they also become borders for me they become um rivers uh, they do have references to uh various other forms um yeah, but the thing about site-specific works is also that you really need to be present. You have to be in that site and space to really experience it. Can we move to the next image, Brian? This is a series that happened again in 2012, and it's called Capsule. Um, I think I go back to the refrigerator once in a while because I also feel I haven't discovered it enough um, and i think in the series uh, what happened was uh, i was i was looking at at the space of the refrigerator as a space which is almost um you know antiseptic in a way and uh, i was imagining all these malls and airports where you know it's it's almost like you could be anywhere any part of the world you could be in in say new york you could be in bombay and all these spaces almost these sterile spaces um, look the same uh, and there's no connection to the outside in that sense and and there uh, these these are also um, like mark augie calls them as uh, non spaces um, and i think these non spaces have this peculiar sense of um, of uh, coldness in them. And, and I thought the refrigerator was just such a appropriate space to kind of um, create that kind of a, a, you know, space. Can we move to the next image, Brian? So I made these sculptural miniature escalators and I have placed them inside the refrigerator and then just taken pictures, There's, there are hardly any Photoshop jobs except I think the tone of the um, image. So here we'll just put a blue um, tone, uh, but hardly any um, Photoshop job done. Um, the escalators become like these sculptural pieces uh, within, within the space. They, I mean, they have a lot of references. For me, they also become like references to, say, a sci-fi, uh, you know, film set. Uh, they could be leftovers of a sci-fi film set. They could be, uh, one could actually be, you know, imagining them as, uh, you know, uh, sites that have been, uh, you know, the, the, that are empty without people. It's also the idea of the escalators about, you know, moving, going somewhere uh, uh, in, in transit. And I think this whole idea of transit um, is, is also something that I was looking at through these words. Can we move to the next image, Brian? Yeah, this is also part of the same series of, um, ascending you know ascending and descending 
through these escalators and, and probably going nowhere, you know, just, just in the means. Um, here, the, my mom's, uh, I think uh, the carpet, the plastic cheap carpet is far more visible. Also, the uh, moisture that gets created because of the coldness of the, uh, the condensation that happens because of the temperature in the refrigerator also adds up to the strangeness of the space, um, which is what I think I kind of um, like within the world. Can we move to the next image, Brian? So they were also shown as light boxes. I made them into light boxes. Um, and they were shown at this museum in Bombay called the Bhavadaji Lad Museum. Can we move to the next image, Brian? This is how they were displayed. Can we move to the next one? Yeah. So this is landscape. Uh, it's, it's a paperwork uh, a drawing. So I go back to, I think, I, I, I need to, I do not have a practice which is a, a steady practice of going to the studio every day and painting every day. So I go through my own um, spaces of, uh, or you know my own ways of working through my process where i think what what painting does is it almost takes you uh in an inward uh kind of moment uh, and and i think that's what painting does to me it, it it you know it slows you down it's almost like you're sitting with yourself and you're not really um uh, you know collaborating with other people especially I mean for photographic works you know you have a light person or uh, things like that or for an for a site specific installation where you know the you are you and the site uh, the physical site becomes a, a certain kind of um, you know uh, thing where whereas a painting is far more uh, I think almost like you know the act of uh, you know you're almost like a monk sitting and trying to sculpt through something um, so this was uh, the image actually is quite self-explanatory in itself it's, it's an image of a bed which has got you know objects and things um, kept underneath it and it's almost like imagining what if these objects that were placed underneath start uh, you know showing up on the bed and, and how does one rest then um, yeah and yeah I mean I I don't know I think painting becomes difficult to also really view through these kind of mediums that we are all watching it through. I think for me, painting has to be viewed in its own presence. Um, but uh, yeah, but I think it was, it's also necessary to see how it, if it works or not it, it, in, in a space like this. Can we move to the next image, Brian? This is also a paperwork. Um, so I titled my works uh, in, in, by giving them, uh, you know, the time uh, so, so this is titled as 1123, uh, and this was a work which I think I made in 2012. Yeah. No, sorry, 2016. This was a work done in 2016. And uh, the whole idea was of, of titling the work with the element of time is also to uh, see if you know, to imagine painting in uh, as though it's, is it, you know, for the viewer to imagine if, if this is made at 1123, uh, or is it trying, is the image trying to define 1123 through this image? Um, and I, I am curious about those questions. And I think defining painting uh, through time was also was to kind of situate this image in some kind of um, the element of time. Um, yeah. 
can we move to the next image so this is called uh, room full of rooms um, it's a site specific uh, installation and this was shown at the kadis thought foundation and i moved and i especially showed this work after the paintings was also to kind of see that uh, share with everyone that this is all for me this is almost like an extension of the paintings into a physical space um i was on a residency in paris for almost two months and i wanted to make a work which was specific to paris and also kind of connected to bombay um it was also a time i think around that time when you know we were, we had we were speaking of the issue of migrant um in bombay especially we had a lot of issues where the right wing was trying to kind of uh, have some violent uh, you know outbursts on migrants who were coming and working in the city they had problems with people coming in and working in the city uh, like bombay which is actually full of migrants um and and i thought it, paris had some similar issues that they were dealing with as well uh, so i was quite sure that i wanted to look at the city through a migrant's window um so what i did in my two months stay was that i visited different people who were living who were the residents of paris uh, of the city and i took different portions of their homes and i projected them onto this painted surface the, these walls of um the gallery were painted in a specific color and i projected these wall uh, these different parts of different people's homes onto the walls um and then made some sculptural installations with it so basically what you see here is actually a window from a tunisian man's house and i wanted to see what how he looks at his own city you know how how a tunisian man looks at the city the ceiling is from a french girl's house um the small door that you see far away is actually a, a family it's it's from a sri lankan family's home um so these were different parts of uh, homes which were kind of put together to make this one singular space can we move to the next image brian and what i did was i used uh, uh basically frill from um, you know uh, these local markets the lace from france and also from bombay that i had carried and i kind of made these sculptural wall installations onto them to almost look like it was like color that was peeling can we move to the next image brian so something like this where you know you see the tunisian man's window and then you see some belongings from some um you know bangladeshi family sri lankan family and and then you have these wall installation wall sculptural pa uh, pieces onto the, uh, the you know the lace onto the wall which almost feels like they were colored walls which were peeling can we move to the next image yeah you know there's the ceiling and i used the slide projector this was also discovery for me i, I was quite the initial idea was to just capture light from one house and kind of um you know place it into the gallery and i think that's the reason i moved to uh the slide projector because they also worked with light um so it was almost a way of collecting light from someone's house and just placing it into the gallery can we move to the next one this is a detail of the work we and the next one so this is another project called uh, there was a home and this was actually shown in shanghai uh these were uh, again wall pieces which uh, i managed to uh, kind of collect from a house which was actually a 100 year old uh, shikuman house which was uh, uh, being broken down and there was a new factory that was going to come on the site so i managed to recover these broken pieces of the walls and i kind of worked on each one of them can we see the next image brian 
So I worked on them in the sense that I stuck paper and wallpaper on them and I placed them onto the onto the walls of the onto these broken walls. And the whole idea of wall as, as a witness to history, as as witness to you know of someone's life. Um, and uh, yeah, so so I was almost in a way layering these each piece with some kind of um, a narrative uh, of sorts. Can we move to the next image? So I have embedded lace in it, paper, drawings, um, in a way to kind of speak off the wall as a witness to a life that was lived. Um, yeah. Can we move to the next one? Yeah, I think I should just move slightly faster. Okay. And uh, again, this is a series titled uh, Capsule, but it was part of my show uh, at Project 88. It was called When the Wind Blows. Um, and uh, these are again everyday objects which were placed inside the refrigerator. Brian, can we move to the next image? This is part of the show now. It's called Capsule 5. Uh, again, this whole idea of, I think, uh, some kind of, I think the whole body of work also happened around the time when I was reading about how not, you know, how there was a seed vault that was being built in Norway and, uh, you know, humans trying to think of ways of inhabiting the, you know, other planets. And it almost felt like, was it some kind of a message that, you know, everybody is trying to tell us that the world is going to end and um, I think this whole body of work kind of has that sense of, you know, what if the world ends? Can we move to the next image? Yeah, this is titled Capsule 202. Again, I worked with cotton and, uh, and this is now happening in the freezer. This is not the um, uh, you know, these are uh, refrigerators which are almost out of circulation. You do get refrigerators now where, you know, ice is not formed. Um, and in our kind of landscape, you know, where we don't see snow, it, uh, you know, you're creating these really small miniature landscapes and staging narratives within these, um, um, you know, these small miniature contrived spaces. Can we move to the next one? Yeah, this is called Wind from the South. This is again the, the refrigerator with you know ice that has been formed in it and imagining landscapes, imagining places and and kind of creating them. Can we move to the next image? This is titled The Eye That Never Sleeps. It's almost like the sense of uh, surveillance here, I think, um, is what I was imagining when I was making it, of being watched. Uh, yeah. Can we move to the next one? This is titled Capsule 504. Uh, these are again, uh, basically these are grinder blades that I found in the market here and I kind of placed them strategically inside the freezer and they almost look like they're these, you know, sci-fi, uh, I don't know, alien things that are crawling and yeah. Can we move to the next one? These are again um, pressure cooker whistles, which are placed. For me, they almost work like some kind of, they have almost like this loud sound that they create in the silent space. There's a sense of dread when I look at them. And I was hoping that they create that. Um, yeah. 
can we move to the next one? This is how they were displayed. Can we move to the next one? This is our installation view. The next one. Yeah. This is titled The Zone. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the film, uh, you know, Tarkovsky's Stalker, and he speaks of this um, space, the zone. He creates that space, the zone, where there are people who are trying to kind of go, and, um, and this zone has its own kind of methods of functioning. Um, I was interested in creating a space which was kind of, you know, it could be a place from nowhere. Um, and I think, yeah, so yeah, that's what one is trying to do by creating these landscapes and these really everyday domestic appliances. Can we move to the next one? And this particular one, which is again part of our uh, exhibition, uh, our online exhibition, what I did was I was, I, I have actually uh, projected a slide projection onto uh, one of the walls of the freezer. Uh, these were slides which I found in a local market in Berlin. They were taken by, um, you know, a traveler. Uh, you know, so these are slides from some 1970s. Um, and uh, yeah, these are slides from really old slides. And these were projected onto the walls to kind of also open up one of the walls and create a space within a space. Um, yeah. Can we move to the next one? This is a more recent work, actually, uh, 2021. This happened during the pandemic. And um, I was also keen on making a work uh, because I think what happened in this whole period was also to imagine a work. Was it possible to make something through a long distance? So this whole installation piece was made through instructions. Uh, these are glow paints, actually. Uh, these are uh, radium glow paints used industrially or you know, on roads as signages. Uh, so what you see here are actually threads and, and chairs which are painted through uh, these paint through this paint that glows in darkness. So it basically has, needs to be charged through tube lights, and then you know once it's charged, it kind of eliminates light. Um, and the whole idea was so so the title of the work is still life in the middle of a crossing and it's almost like you have these two points of view and there's a chair in the middle um but this was an entire instructional piece i was in there making it and I, it, it was made by some artist students and and i was seeing the work through long distance um and i was speaking to Catherine about it that you know is it possible to make work through long distance and this was completely an experiment in that and uh, I do feel a lot disconnected with this work um, but it's interesting it's also a way to see if it's possible to make works from long distance where one is not probably physically possible to move I think uh, can we move to I think I'll, I'll skip this work and, and this one as well um, but I wanted to show two videos and I think we can try and squeeze that. Can we play this video uh, of the crows, Brian? So basically on one of the terraces uh, here on the outskirts of Bombay, uh, no, within the city actually, uh, I found these two crows who were, uh, you know, at it uh, uh, on something and I started uh, documenting them. And uh, they were basically trying to peck onto a, a takeaway menu card. 
and uh, what i realized that uh, i managed to recover the takeaway menu card that they were pecking on and what i managed to find was that they had actually created uh, forms of birds um through their packing and uh, i find this this visual absolutely beautiful or this moment of making absolutely beautiful because for me it's almost like uh, art making in a way where you know you are uh, you're also present in a moment trying to see something and 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 discover something and then there are these two uh, crows that are trying to kind of create some something uh, i can just quickly show an image of brian can we go to the earlier slide i think it's slide number 48 so the image that you see on the left um is actually the found uh, uh you know found the menu card that the crows were pecking on it was quite uh, amazing to see these crows uh, create these forms of crows or birds on to them it's almost like the crows made a self portrait of of themselves by pecking on it and uh, i think the last one and i think i'd like to end with this last uh, slide of a uh, last video of the night vision that was part of the show brian can you please play the video so this was a video actually which was uh, projected onto uh, the walls of a gallery um, and i think it works quite differently within uh, the online uh, you know setup um the whole idea was to make these uh, gas uh, burners uh, or or you know rings of fire to almost look like they were eyes or iris is looking back at the viewer um but i think they work quite differently in in the digital space uh, uh, in the in the digital format of viewing this work if they become more abstracted in a way um but i think more we can speak more about it uh, through through questions and i think that's about it uh, thanks brian and uh, Yeah, can we take the calls? I think I'll end mine here. Well, thank you so much. This was really amazing. Um, thank you, Projecta. So, uh, okay. thank you. So, we have um, really some amazing questions coming in through the chat, and mm -hmm. um, I am going to try to group them together and ask you a couple of questions as a set. um so that hopefully we can we have a little bit more time to um to respond to them so um and also i just have to say my mind is just buzzing with so much uh there's so many works here that i hadn't seen before and it's really amazing to see this trajectory over your career so thank you um so the first group of que of questions um these are a, a group that sort of come from uh, we have a lot of students in the audience tonight um and i want to sort of put these together because they're about how you sort of uh approached how you've gotten over obstacles in a way um as a maker um someone who was a student as you showed us at the beginning and then moved on so um the first one as part of this group is from jacob who says um have you ever experienced the writer's block but instead for an artist so artist block um and if so how did you overcome this as an artist um another question is coming from rebecca who says how did you keep hope in yourself as an artist as a musician i was also inspired by my teachers because my family are not artists and wanted me to study anything pretty much anything else and a related one from um rasuk who says coming from a similar family background with a conservative mindset i wanted to ask advice on how you stayed true to your artistic uh your artistic pursuit and um also 
part of this is another one is from Lim, who asks, um, as it is often the qualm of the artist to call a piece of work finished, are these works constantly being adjusted, modified, just like the general theme of your work? Moreover, as budding artists ourselves, we often call, we often call a piece of work finished when it's the end of the semester. <laughs> so being an artist that's already successfully finished school, how do you typically close the chapter on a specific series, painting, or installation? So maybe I can invite you to speak to that, that group of questions together. These are beautiful. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you, everyone who, uh, yeah, you know, who were listening so carefully. It's uh, yeah, it's quite heartening. Uh, well, writer's block, artist block happens quite often, and uh, it, it it you know the initial few times when it happens, it's quite scary. You feel you're never going to come back to uh, you know making anything. Um, and uh, today, now after this, uh, you know, after working for the number of years, I know these are phases. I know they, they happen in phases where, you know, you make a body of work and then there's absolutely uh, a phase where there's no work that happens. But then you try and kind of be at it. Uh, and I try to be at it through, say, watching films, through reading, through at least being in um, in connect with with the work somewhere, uh, uh, but I think it's also necessary for me to totally forget uh, what I was doing, to totally not work, to say probably spend time cooking and doing absolutely other things, and and trust that it will you know fall in place and you will be able to think of something exciting because the whole idea is that it has to excite you otherwise you can keep making um and uh, so yeah so so just trust yourself it 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 will uh, you know it will come back uh, you will come back with ideas um i think the second question um uh, was about uh, conservative family. Okay, can you please repeat it, Catherine? Yes. So the second part was um, uh, basically, how do you keep um, hope in yourself as an artist? Um, mm -hmm. Rebecca was asking as a musician herself, um, her family yeah. is uh, is not artists and wanted her to pick something else to study. And mm -hmm. also Rosix was asking about somebody coming from, uh, someone coming from a family with a conservative mindset. What, it, what advice do you have for staying true to your artistic pursuit? You have to kind of, I think initially it was uh, quite difficult because uh, you know you had to constantly say that this is what you have to do this is what you believe in and, and you, know, you just have to keep stating yourself um, and uh, there, there's just no other way you know you just have to keep stating yourself gently politely uh, you have to just be at it because uh, I think that's when but you also have to uh, I mean, for me, I realized that, you know, I at one point I was so rebellious. I was like, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to, uh, you know, do what I have to do. Uh, but you also realize uh, today, at you know, after so many years that you also need your family support once in a while. You need uh, rescue money sometimes uh, because the life of an artist is extremely unpredictable. It is not something where, you know, you, you can, uh, and especially for us in India, it's quite complicated. We do not have state support. We do not have jobs that we can take where you can have a part-time career and you can also pursue a full-time art career Career, it's extremely complicated um, so you you just have to be at it is, is the only uh, there's no other option so and I think the families give up finally you know they, they that's the point they have to just give up on you and and you know let you do what you have to do um, but I th I think they yeah th as, a, as a female artist I think they always wanted um me to be i think their their efforts were not bad i mean they, they wanted me to be an independent woman they didn't want me to be dependent on my father uh, on my 
you know, on my husband is, I think that's why one is asking, you know, this child to probably pursue careers like engineering or, or, or doctor or, you know, something in computers, because you feel like the, the study, steady jobs, uh, which is to an extent true, but, uh, but what to do? I mean, this, this is what one was probably assigned to do or wanted to do so. Yeah, so, so I had to, I, I mean, I stopped convincing them. I just had to do what I had to do. That, that's what it was. Um, yeah, and I hope uh, you guys are able to pursue that with full faith. Yeah. And there was one more last one, I think, which was... Uh, the last one was about how do you know when something is finished? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's a, I don't think, uh, because I, especially in my own practice, I keep going back, I keep tweaking things within the work, I keep uh, taking something from a painting and moving it into a sculptural piece or a site-specific installation. So a complete uh, work is never uh, really complete in that sense. Uh, uh, yeah, and also, especially in painting, sometimes, you know, you keep going back at something, uh, say, for two months, three months, and you know it's not complete. And and then it could just be one element of, say, a book or, or you know, just, just one element that you add and that you'd not thought of. And uh, it all comes together. So it's just about that tying of that one knot somewhere, which, you know, makes the picture feel all right. So um, in 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 in... In the perspective of, in a larger perspective, I feel that uh, it, it's nice to keep open ends and it's nice to keep going back at something and tweaking it. Um, and uh, yeah, and not really thinking of making that complete work in that sense. I, I don't know that. Yeah. Thank you. This is wonderful. So um, we have, we have like a couple more minutes here. Um, yeah. And there are more questions. So I wonder if I can ask you, um, there are actually two questions. So I think your work has um, so many dichotomies uh, that you're bringing together um, and asking us to hold these contradictions. So um, things like uh, preservation and decay or things like uh, porosity and uh, cancerous growth, or this, um, this kind of thing. So these two questions, I think, are picking up on that tendency in your work. Um, the first one is from uh, Shimram, who says, how does an Indian audience perceive your art compared to Western audiences? Um, so this kind of uh, split. And I'm quite curious about that as well. And there was also a question and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not sure uh, who asked this question. But there is a question that says, um, do you get, get your ideas from the natural world or the material one? So those maybe those two, my, uh, bringing together all of these sort of extremes yeah. in your work might be a nice yeah. way to. Yeah. Well, I mean, one is working with uh, things immediately around. Uh, and one is trying to kind of understand what's happening around oneself uh, to kind of draw inspiration from. So um, it could be the body, it could be an appliance, it could be, you know, uh, an infection on the skin too. It could be, um, you know, these absolutely mysterious spaces of the inside of a washing machine maybe. Um, and I think one is trying to, I mean, I'm trying to probably uh, draw from these um, uh, also things which hopefully one feels that they're not, uh, you know, something that are there within the uh, language of art so much in, in terms of you're not going to really see a washing machine. I mean, you also want to see if a washing machine can be placed or, or you know, can be can become or create that kind of uh, uh, emotional, uh, you know, uh, thing which can probably you know activate something within the viewer. Uh, so, so from that mundaneness, is it possible? So you're also trying to look at 
these really unexpected objects in that sense uh, and hoping that they can activate something for the viewer. Um, for the Indian audience, I, I really hope that they are able to see through a certain kind of uh, locality, which probably uh, the Western aud audience or, or the audience outside might not be able to see. Um, like, like the kitchen, uh, for instance, I think when an Indian audience is uh, watching it, I, I'm hoping that they come with a uh, lot more, uh, you know, uh, textures in that sense, or their own understanding of the kitchen where you know for us kitchen becomes has so many other meanings of where issues of labor caste can also be spoken of um, so i'm just hoping that and i don't know if they are if they see it differently but, but everybody sees things through their own perspective so i am hoping that there is you know they're able to see it through their own lens yeah I hope I've managed to answer. Thank you. That is, that's such a great uh, note to end on, the idea of everyone with their own lens, because I think that's one of the things that you really offer us is so many different um, lenses to see things that are quite familiar and to see them in a new way. Um, I want to thank you so much for this uh, for this talk tonight, for sharing so generously. I want to thank our live stream audience and thank you everyone for such amazing questions. I apologize that we didn't get to all of them, um, but uh, thank you so much for coming. And Brian, thank you for, uh, yeah. for, for steering us today. Completely. You. So we're going to put up, I think Brian has one last um, closing image and you can, see if you do, if you haven't, of course, if you haven't already uh, had a moment to see the exhibition, um, Brian has a slide, I think, with the, uh, with all of the details where you can see things. Um, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Kathleen. Bye. <laughs>